The thing that got me was that they scraped his hands. They took a piece of glass or a knife with the edge, scraped the heel and the palm of his hand down to his fingertips. They were trying to remove something, something that they had applied to his hands years ago. It was supposed to be a holy anointing oil, an oil applied to his hands to signify the sacredness of the duties he would perform. Everything that he would touch, from the vessels of his service to the bread and wine he would distribute, to the anointing of the sick and the blessing of others. His hands were symbolically anointed of God to perform each sacred task. But on this mild sixth day of October in 1536, the very men that anointed William's hands were doing everything they could to take it back, to undo what he had done, to use his humiliation and execution as a threat to all who would dare to follow in his steps. But those anointed hands, grasping pen and ink and feverishly writing line by line, word by word, had already done their work. They had unleashed a fire, removed the blindfold of ignorance to allow the illumination of the revealed word of God to shine into the hearts and minds of the common man. Scrape all they might, but they would never undo what those anointed hands had already done. I'm Ronnie Brown, and this is Forgotten. William Tyndale was born in Gloucestershire, England, around the year 1485. He began a Bachelor's of Arts degree at Oxford University in 1506, finishing in 1512, and received his Master of Arts in July 1515. Tyndale was uniquely gifted in the study and the use of languages. He became fluent over the years in French, Greek, Hebrew, German, Italian, Latin, and Spanish, as well as his native English. Between 1517 and 1521, he went to the University of Cambridge, also becoming the chaplain at the home of Sir John Walsh of Little Sodbury and tutor to his children around 1521. At the onset of his ministry, he found conflict, or rather conflict found him. His opinions and convictions were alarming to his fellow clergymen. Although no formal charges were brought against him, he was brought before the church leaders to answer questions concerning some of his statements. Back in the 14th century, a priest by the name of John Wycliffe had translated the Bible into English. But such a work was condemned by the Catholic Church, and a majority of the relatively few handwritten copies were rounded up and destroyed. In 1408, the Church banned all unauthorized translations of the Bible into English. To ignore this ban would make one guilty of a crime punishable by charges of heresy. Over a hundred years later, William Tyndale had a burning desire to translate the Bible into English and voiced that desire openly. The meeting with church officials was contentious, and the clergyman made it clear that no such translation of the scriptures was to be made, stating, quote, We had better be without God's laws than the Pope's. End quote. Infuriated at the audacity of such a statement, William boldly said, quote, I defy the Pope and all his laws, and if God spares my life ere many years, I will cause the boy that driveth the plow to know more of the scriptures than thou dost, end quote. Tyndale left London in 1523 in hopes of gaining permission to translate the Bible into English from Bishop Tunstall. Tunstall had worked recently with Erasmus on compiling a Greek New Testament. So Tyndale had every reason to suspect that he might be favorable to a translation of the scriptures into English. But Tyndale was refused. Yet this determined young man would not be stifled by a few setbacks. It was plainly obvious to him 
that the will of God was that men of all classes read the Word of God. With the help of some British merchants, he set sail for Europe in 1524 to complete the English translation that he had already begun working on. In the town of Cologne, Germany, he found a printer willing to print his translation of the New Testament. But midway through the work, Reformation opponents caught wind of what he was doing and led a raid against the print shop. Tyndale barely escaped, but not without the few pages that had already been printed. He secretly made his way to the city of Worms, where only a few years passed, a Catholic monk took his stand of conscience on the Word of God. There, William found another printer, and despite some delays and setbacks, by 1526, 6,000 copies of the New Testament were printed and spread all over England and Scotland. Once the Catholic bishops in England found out, they did everything they could to stop the flow of New Testaments into the country demanding that ships carrying goods over from Europe be thoroughly searched. Bibles were wrapped in bales of cloth, hidden in barrels of flour. Some even came in individual pages, slipped into other books to be reassembled in secret upon arrival. The search for these Bibles were so intensive that ships would be forced through long inspections before ever entering the docks. Some accounts tell of a drought that took place in 1527 that had crowds awaiting grain from Europe nearly in a riot, waiting on these inspections to be completed, putting pressure on church authorities to let down their guard and allowing even more of these Bibles to slip into London. The Bibles that were confiscated were burned publicly as a denunciation of Tyndale's work. The Archbishop of Canterbury was so desperate to remove these books from circulation that he would pay whatever the cost to buy up all that remained only to destroy them. Tyndale's friends did just that, charged absorbent rates and delivered the Bibles. The high profit margin only allowed William to edit and improve his translation and print all the more copies of the New Testament. Tyndale continued his work on the Old Testament, for which he had to learn Hebrew, a language that he did not know when he arrived in Europe. In 1530, he completed the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Old Testament, despite having to do the work a second time due to his manuscripts being lost when he suffered shipwreck. At the end of his ministry, 51,000 copies of the New Testament had been distributed in England and Scotland, laying the foundation for Reformation in the English-speaking world. Church authorities in England sent many stealthy spies with orders to arrest Tyndale and return him to England to stand trial. But despite the fact that he had made no great efforts to keep his whereabouts a secret, Tyndale always eluded capture. There is little doubt that there was a holy hand protecting his way. But when he had accomplished the work that God had sent him to do, William Tyndale was captured. A man by the name of Henry Phillips posed as a friend interested in the spread of the scriptures. He established a close relationship of trust with Tyndale, even with the protest of Tyndale's trusted inner circle. One night after having dinner at Phillips' home, Tyndale was arrested and taken to the castle of Philfort near Brussels. He would remain in prison there for nearly 18 months in miserable conditions of heat and cold, little to no light, ragged clothing and starvation rations, without friends to encourage his art or books to feed his mind. The only interaction that he would have would be with a constant stream of antagonistic priests constantly badgering and baiting him, tempting him to recant. But the faith in God that possessed him in his academic pursuits was unbending in the fires of persecution. He maintained a Christ-like love through the end. He wrote these words to his accusers, quote, Christ is the cause why I love thee, why I am ready to do the utmost of my power for thee, and why I pray for thee. As long as the cause abideth, so long lasting the effect, even as it is day, so long as the sun shineth, end quote. Sometime in the early days of the month of August in 1536, he endured the humiliation of being defrocked, stripped of his priestly status in the Catholic Church. In a very public ceremony, he was brought before a group of presiding bishops where he would be removed from the priesthood. Tyndale was brought before them in his priestly garments. No doubt he was dressed in them for the occasion and forced to kneel before the church leaders. His hands were then scraped with a knife or a piece of glass 
in any location where the anointing oil might have touched him in order to renounce his consecration as a priest. And then the elements of the Lord's table were placed in his hands and then quickly snatched away. Then the priestly garments that he wore were torn away from his body and the rags of a peasant were placed upon him. He was then condemned to death and handed over to the secular authorities so as not to stain their hands with the blood of martyrs. Having been placed under arrest, he was taken back to the castle of Philfort to await execution. That wait lasted two whole months, probably in hopes of drawing from him a recantation as he faced death. They received no pleasure. In the early morning hours of October 6th, William Tyndale was led out of the castle at Philfort to the southern gate of the town. A clearing was prepared along with a wooden stake. A chain hung from the top of the stake that was placed around his neck. Then a noose of rope was placed around the throat of Tyndale, the end of which was threaded through the stake. His torso and legs were chained to the stake as well. As the eyes of all looked upon him, he was given one last opportunity to recant before the presiding panel of bishops and officers. William remained silent. As piles of brushwood and logs were heaped around him, his eyes turned toward heaven, and with a clear, loud cry, he made this final prayer. Quote, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. End quote. With that, the executioner violently pulled the rope, strangling Tyndale in a matter of moments. A torch was then applied to the brush, which quickly consumed the body of William Tyndale. Try as they might, they could never undo what the hands of William Tyndale had done. His highly accurate and skillful translation of the scriptures from the ancient Hebrew and Greek manuscripts has had a lasting effect, not only on all subsequent Bible translations, but on Western civilization as a whole. Studies have shown that 90% of the beloved and highly influential authorized version or King James version of the Bible was taken directly from Tyndale's translation. Even the Revised Standard Version carries some 75% of Tyndale's work. This determined and hunted man, hunched over parchments with quill and inkwell, gave to the English-speaking church such memorable phrases as, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And other phrases, too numerous to name, have become such a part of the English-speaking world that newspaper reporters often use such phrases in their headlines without even realizing their quotations from Tyndale's English translation of the Bible. Truly this reveals the sheer genius and linguistic mastery of the servant of God a mind and heart anointed of God to accomplish a task that no man could stop. For as Tyndale would translate the words of the Apostle Peter, all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth and the flower fadeth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. Forgotten is written and produced by me, Ronnie Brown. You can find out more about this show at ForgottenPodcast.com. I'm also on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Forgotten Podcast. Forgotten is now available on various podcasting apps such as iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Downcast. Be sure to stop in at iTunes and leave a review. And as always... Thanks for listening.